Okay, cool. So back to Anselm. Um, last time we really only covered, I guess, the first three chapters or so um, of On the Fall of the Devil. Uh, was there anything in there that we want to go back over? Because we made a, a lot of careful, minute distinctions in there about the will, about choice, about good and evil, and that kind of thing, before we move on. Anything left to discuss in those first three or so chapters? All right. If not, then um, I want to look at chapter four and five. These kind of go together a bit. Um, and they sort of lead into six. So I want to get through at least these next three, and we'll probably keep going, because these, these are a little bit less complicated and a little bit less in depth uh, than, say, chapter four, or sorry, chapter three. Um, so in chapter four, uh, the student starts to ask about uh, how it is, or what exactly it was that the devil did to fall. We've looked so far at how, um, how the devil could have made a choice, uh, what that choice could have looked like as far as abandoning rectitude of the will, right, abandoning justice, that whole thing. Um, but the question is still in the air, what was he choosing? And what were the angels choosing between? So we have from, uh, from, from scripture and revelation and tradition and all of that stuff, uh, we have, like we were saying last time, um, we have very, very little information about the details of the fall of Satan, right? So we kind of just know a few, we kind of know that, well, Satan fell. It was at the establishment of the world. It was through something to do with pride. That's kind of it. Uh, it had something to do with, uh, with the tradition at this point is that it had something, it was something similar to the, the fall of Adam. Insofar, it was, insofar as it was uh, a desire to be like God, or to take the place of God, or to put oneself before God, or something like that. And that's what they're at least assuming that it was meant by the pride of Satan. But so we have to look at exactly how that could work. Right? So, all right, so he asks initially, How is it that Satan willed to be like God? Do we see the problem with willing to be like God for an angel? Do we see why that would seem implausible? Why? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, because, you know, God is supposed to be, like, this divinely powerful being, and if angels are only supposed to really be his harbingers, then there is no greater being, like, to his, like, likeness. Right, yeah, exactly. Remember who we're reading, right? We're reading Anselm. The last thing we read by Anselm was the ontological argument, right? Where he talks about God as being so completely separate from and above the world, being that than which no greater can be conceived or can be thought. So we're talking about absolute maximal perfection in every way, in every capacity, with no limitations whatsoever. It seems odd, maybe impossible, for an angel, the greatest of the angels, God's pinnacle of creation at this point, who is presumably rather intelligent and rather wise, by which I mean certainly more wise and intelligent than we are or than Anselm is, to think that he can become greater than that than which no greater can be thought, right? That seems, that seems obviously contradictory. And so this is what the student is pointing out, right? The student in the dialogue is pointing out that this seems like something that the devil should have known better. The devil shouldn't have thought ah, I can be like God, or I can be greater than God, or I can take the place of God. That would be an absurd thing for an angel who is created, and, uh, created directly by God and has uh, the immediate beatific vision, the vision of God, knows God immediately and, in, and, uh, and directly. That would seem kind of silly 
for for an angel to think they could be like God. Okay, well, how is it then? What was this act of will to be like God then? What do you guys think? If it wasn't just to be God or to, to be like God in the absolute ontological sense, then what was it exactly that the devil willed? Yeah. I know I read something about happiness in the text. Mm -hmm. There was happiness and justice comparison. Yeah. Yeah, so so this is um this is a little bit further where he gets into this in detail, so we'll we'll have to come back to like the, the precise details of how these work together. But um he talks about there being at least two basic things that one can will or can desire, right? Can be inclined towards. Right? So if we remember that threefold distinction of will, you can have the ability to will something, you can have the inclination for something, and then you can have the action. And this is talking mostly about that middle part, right? So there's at least two things that we can be inclined towards, we can have a will for, justice and advantage. That is, we can will the right thing because it is the right thing, or we can will what is advantageous for us, for our own sake. And at times, at least, Anselm is going to posit that these two come into conflict. Right? There are times when doing the right thing means, uh, means shunning or abandoning our own advantage. Right? Doing something that, is, that might be either detrimental to ourselves or at least not ideal for ourselves in favor of doing the right thing or vice versa, right? So we're presented with this strong moral choice. And this is the kind of moral choice that he thinks that the devil must have been confronted with. Because that's really the only kind of morally significant choice that you can have. For or against justice, well, for again, against can only really be against justice if it is in favor of something else, right? And what else could that be? Well, some kind of advantage, some kind of selfish advantage. So, so it has to be something like that, right? It has to be this choice between advantage and justice, or the will of God, what God has willed for the devil to will. But what advantage, or, no, that's getting ahead of ourselves, because that isn't until like chapter 20 or so, because um, he doesn't answer that question yet, and we'll look at why. Um, but how is it that willing one's own advantage instead of justice is how could that be described as willing to be like God? Fairness in the sense of, of um, again, this isn't an ethics class, I don't want to get into like, the details of it, but something along the lines of um, what is owed to each, individ each other person, right? So justice is about um, treating things correctly, treating things properly. Right? So the, the just or fair thing to, <laughs> bless you, the, the just or fair way to treat people is by respecting each of their inherent dignity as persons, that sort of thing, and not using people for your own advantage. Right, so in that sense, right, fairness, right? So fair exchange is another common category of justice. So, you know, a fair trade is one where, where both are better off and one is not taking advantage of the other or tricking somebody or that kind of thing. So, continue, what, what, what more do you think about this? Basically, what you were saying, I feel like if someone's trying to will for an advantage, they're mm -hmm. trying to, um, they're imbalancing justice in a way. So they're trying to make themselves greater than everyone, only God. Yeah, I like where you're going with this. Um, it, it's a slightly different way of, of, of stating this or explaining this than Anselm does, but I think it works. So the way you're laying it out, If justice is about 
fairness, treating things the way they ought to be treated, treating things in, in the way that is in accord with what they are and what they merit and what they deserve, what, what you owe them, that sort of thing. Then taking advantage in favor of justice is, like you said, trying to tip the scale in your favor, right? So if, if you and I are equal in a lot of terms, right? If I were to seek my own advantage at your expense, what I would be doing is I would be treating us as unequal. I would be acting as if I am greater than you. Now, let's suppose that, uh, that um, we are unequal. Right? <laughs> let's suppose that we're radically unequal in some way. Right? Let's, say that, let's say that you're God and I'm Lucifer, hypothetically. Um, and that justice would say that I treat you and I unequally, but in a particular kind of way, right? I owe you a lot of things, basically, you know, everything, being God. Um, it's getting a little blasphemous, but it, sorry. Um, we're okay, uh, all hypothetical. Right? But if I owe God everything, and I do not give that to God, right, if I don't offer everything to God, if I hold back something of my own, what I'm doing is I am saying I deserve this, God doesn't. So what I'm doing is I am I'm giving to myself what I ought to give to God. Just like if you and I, right, ordinary human persons who are, who are equal in morally relevant respects, right, if I say I'm going to give myself something that I ought to give to you, right, if I borrow something from you and never give it back, for example, what I'm doing is I'm saying implicitly, I deserve this thing. And I'm saying that contrary to the fact of the matter. Because justice would demand that you deserve this thing. Right? If I borrow something from you, you need it back. I owe it to you. And if I say, no, I'm keeping it, what I'm saying essentially is I am taking my will to be over and above, more important than overruling justice, the way that things are. And more so, I'm taking myself to be more important than you. Okay, so if we put this exchange back in the case of God and Satan, if Satan says that I want this thing that I owe to God, God ought to have it, but I want to have it myself. What's he effectively saying? Yeah, right? That he is, in some sense, owed this thing and God isn't. He's saying that this, ex this exchange that should be unequal in a very particular, specific way should go the other direction. He is, in effect, placing himself above God by saying that I want and I deserve and I'm going to take this advantage, whatever this thing is that will benefit me, even though that should be God's prerogative. So I'm taking that over, and therefore I am greater. Right? So he's putting himself in the moral place of God, not necessarily the metaphysical or the ontological place of God. But he's saying that in terms of what he earns, what he deserves, what he has, what he is, that he is, to his mind, better than God. So that's one way of looking at it. There's a lot of ways of looking at this. Um, another is to, uh, is to analogize it to the fall, to the fall of man, that is. Um, that, well, how is it exactly that eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is seen as an act of pride, an act of willing to be like God? Because it's very closely analogous. Wasn't the truth supposed to make them like see truth or something? Like, or, or something like that. I don't um, know. Tigers, maybe, yeah. Wasn't it like the serpent um, told them that he would, they would have the knowledge that God has, so they were going to put themselves equal to God in that sense? Yeah, so they would take into themselves some knowledge or some. Um, well, let's just limit it to knowledge for now, and then we'll build on that. Right? Some knowledge that is the prerogative of God alone. Right? 
the knowledge of good and evil in particular. So this is moral knowledge. So it has something to do with justice. So again, we're already building analogies here. This is already getting kind of close to our story about the devil. And so, OK, the knowledge of good and evil, this is um, knowledge. I'll just wait. OK. Um, <laughs> two more. Right. Really good. Two more. <laughs> I know. It, uh, I have two more classes. I have two more chances. I have one more chance, because the battery will die if I do two in a row. Um, anyway, <laughs> I might just cut all that out. Who knows? Um, so eating the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or the tree of life, what, what the sin was there is taking something that ought to be God's prerogative. But we need to put a pin in this, because it may also be that, because thinking about the eschaton, that is the end of the world, the 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 perfected state of uh, of uh, of justice after the second coming, and all of that. God intends for mankind to have the knowledge of good and evil, knowledge on par with God. We're supposed to have the beatific vision, the immediate apperception of God. So we're supposed to have this. We're supposed to have what would be granted by the tree, but not yet. Not in its due time, or in its due time, not so now. Yeah. So it's basically like I guess you could say like it's on timing, it's patience, in a way. Yeah. You have to wait for it and nurture it. So. Yeah. Keep that in mind, because that's chapter six. Keep that in mind, because this is exactly what Anselm is talking about. The fall of the devil is going to be something like a grasping at something that you're not supposed to have, at least not yet. Yeah. Okay, so. Continuing on about this knowledge of good and evil thing. So knowledge, another aspect of knowledge is authority. Right? Part of what knowledge does is it grants authority. And so the knowledge of good and evil is at least in part the authority over calling good good and evil evil. Now, why this connection between knowledge and authority? Think of it in academic terms. We talk about uh, not just, you know, authorities in the sense of uh, you know, um, governmental authorities or whatever. We also talk about authorities in terms of intellectual authorities. So I am an authority on this subject. The other professors around here are authorities on their own particular subject. And the reason for that isn't because of you know, the degree we have, or it isn't because we're you know, hired into a particular position. The authority is something to do with our knowledge, what we know about the subject. Knowing about the subject is enough to be an authority because it's enough to say the truth, to know what the truth is and to say it. And so taking on this knowledge of good and evil is essentially taking on the authority of God over good and evil. It is a lot of the tradition will read this as, let me put it this way, that it is taking on the ability to decide what is good and evil. In other words, it is the ability to choose, not just the ability, but the actual, the active choice, right? This third part of that three part part of the will, right? The active choice to do something, implying implicitly that that is the right thing to do. In other words, it's placing one's own will before the will of God. It's pride again very similar to the fall of Satan. Now, there's also, um, there's also a tradition uh, which goes back to uh, Athanasius, one of the relatively early church fathers. I think it was Athanasius. Don't necessarily quote me on that. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can figure out who this was, because I should have looked this up. Um, that, that puts forward that the fall of Satan and the fall of man happened simultaneously. right? That in the garden, when the serpent tempts Eve, that temptation is also the act of Satan choosing to turn away from God. By taking onto himself this role of authority, this role of granting knowledge and granting good and evil, granting, granting authority that God alone should have, that this is the same thing. Right? The fall occurs for man and for angels simultaneously. And it wasn't an act of, it wasn't an act of, 
Satan falling and then having been fallen, then tempting Eve, then tempting Adam. It was all one thing, right? That the fall of Satan and the fall of man co-occur. But they happen simultaneously. The same, um, bless you, the same, the same action, the same choice, the same fall, that they act together against God to turn both of themselves away from God. That's speculative. That's because, again, we don't have much uh, in scripture and revelation and tradition even about uh, anything definitive really about the fall of Satan. But that's one model where, where it's worth noting. It also eliminates this problem of why did God permit Satan to fall and then still have influence over the world? Because then it seems like it was Satan's fault that man fell. And that takes, first of all, takes some of the... Um, some of the responsibility away from Adam and Eve. And then also, it seems to be irresponsible of God to let the serpent into the garden. So this winds up fixing a lot of those issues, potentially at least. Okay, there's one more way we can look at this. Um, and this is an example I want to draw from uh, St. Augustine, who wrote a, a while earlier than Anselm. So Anselm had some of these ideas in his mind. Uh, and this is from um, Augustine's book, The Confessions, which was a kind of spiritual autobiography mixed in with a bunch of philosophical stuff. Like, the last three chapters, which are about the, the later years of his life, ostensibly, are really about the philosophy of language and the philosophy of time. It's very little about actually himself. But that's not the part I want to talk about. I want to talk about an incident that occurred uh, when he was a young man, probably a teenager. <clears throat> um, has anyone heard of heard the story of the theft of the pears? No. Okay. I didn't think so. Maybe. Sound familiar? Okay. Seeing, if, see if this rings any bells as I as I go through it. Um, so Augustine was a young man, juvenile delinquent, hanging out with his heathen, his heathen hooligan friends, um, and they were out one night. They may have been drunk. Um, and, but not too drunk, because that's important for the story, that they knew what they were doing. Um, and they decide to go onto someone's property, uh, go over to a pear tree, and start stealing pears. Just stealing them, just taking them. Okay. And he goes into explaining, well, why is it that he did this? He knew it was wrong. He knew he should not have done it, but he did it anyway. He and his friends all did. And he begins speculating, like, why could this have been? Well, it could have been because I wanted pears, but I didn't. None of us did. We threw them away. We gave them to the pigs. We didn't actually want them. We just wanted to steal them. And he thinks about, well, maybe it was something about the, about the farmer. Maybe we wanted something. Maybe, we, maybe it was out of a disordered desire out of, to harm the person whose tree it was. But he rules that out, too, because he didn't even know whose it was. He didn't know who they belonged to. It was just some stranger that he had happened to walk by their property and started stealing pears. And then he speculated maybe it was something like camaraderie, right? Maybe it was because all of his friends wanted to do it that he did it and participated as well. Maybe it was something like peer pressure. But he rules that out too because someone had to have the idea, even if it wasn't his initially. The idea had to start somewhere. Can we grab that? That's about to fall. But anyway, so Augustine has this opportunity to do something wrong for what seems to be no particular reason other than it's wrong. But that seems like it should be impossible by Augustine's reasoning, which is very similar to Anselm's, that evil is nothing. There's nothing about evil that makes it worth choosing. There's nothing appealing about it because it's nothing, right? So what gives? How could he have made this choice? So he winds up sort of concluding, because he really only alludes to, alludes to an answer here that he winds up answering elsewhere. But he winds up eventually concluding that it's a kind of desire to be like God. How? How could stealing pears be like God? Keeping in mind all of the discussion we've had, yeah. Someone, something that's someone else's that they don't need? Presumably they do, right? Presumably they would harvest these and either eat them or sell them. I'm seeing, oh, the people that stole them. I thought you said 
Oh, oh, okay. No, I misunderstood you. Sorry. Yeah, the people who stole them didn't need them. Right, so you're right. Yeah. So I thought you meant that the person whose tree it was didn't need them. No, okay. Sorry. I misinterpreted. Go ahead. I, yeah, but I don't, I'm not exactly sure, but I guess it would just be, like, if someone willed to be like God, they're doing something that they don't need to do. Or they're, they're mm -hmm. that comparison that you made with the whole taking something that should be given to God. Mm -hmm. So they're taking something that doesn't belong to them. So part of it can be that they are they are treating themselves as more important than their equals, so the, the owner of the tree, right? And so they're placing more moral significance on themselves than on somebody else. Now, first of all, this isn't the answer that Augustine gives exactly. But even in our, but in our terms, I want to be careful about that because the exchange is between equals. And just because you're treating yourself as better than another equal doesn't mean necessarily that you're treating yourself as better than God. Now, it could be that you are treating yourself as better than God because God said, do not steal, and you're stealing. Right? And you're saying that, you know, I'm doing something here because I think my own advantage is more important than justice, like, like what we were talking about with the context of the devil. But there's another way. There's another way that we can look at this. That uh, that Augustine looks at this. Any other any guesses before I spoil it? Give it away. Yeah. That like maybe it's this, like not even thinking that they're better than somebody else, and so they steal from them. It's like the arrogance and thinking that there that there would be like no consequences for doing so. So. Like, yeah. it's not like an insular situation. Like, somebody will be affected. And just because you're not thinking of another person doesn't necessarily mean that you think that you're better than them when you, like, do an action. Uh, yeah, I think you're getting closer to what, to what Augustine has to say, right? It, so part of it is thinking that you are, you know, sufficiently important or sufficiently clever that you're also going to get away with this. Now, um, according to the account, they did get away with it, right? But thinking that in the moment is very different from how things turn out. Right? And then further, thinking that you, for some reason, have a right to do this. Right? Thinking that, you know, if, here's an example. When I was probably around the same age as Augustine, um, there was, uh, on my way home, when I walked home from, uh, from school or the bus stop or whatever, <coughs> um, there was a, uh, an old sort of beaten down fence uh, around somebody's house that I would, on occasion, just throw things at to see if I could break boards on it. Right? For no good reason, just to see if I could, right? What in the world gave me the idea that that would be something that I ought to be doing? Is it like the feeling of you, like you were explaining the whole, like you teach philosophy, you have authority over that. Uh -huh. like, have the knowledge of that and so someone else who teaches another thing here can't come in not because they're not smart enough but because like they don't have the authority they don't have the degree mm -hmm. for it so it's like you're giving yourself authority over what you can do and what exactly. you want to do exactly yeah so that's augustine's idea right it's that by augustine stealing the pears or by me like throwing rocks at a fence or whatever stuff that is low level Sure, it hurts somebody, or at least it hurts, it, it, it indirectly hurts somebody. To a minor, maybe nuisance level, but still, it's something. And it's something that we ought not to do, um, us annoying teenagers. What we are functionally doing in moral terms is we are taking unto ourselves this, um, this authority to decide, I should do this. This is the right thing for me to do. That's a prerogative of God. Because God creates the world, and with it, all of the moral structures of the world. Right? Equality, justice, fairness, all of, the, all of the good and evil that we see in the world. What this action winds up doing is I am saying, I'm taking it onto myself to decide what the good is, to decide what's right, what's wrong. And that's placing myself in the position of God. That's how Augustine saw it. And that's, I think, how we can read this as well, at least one way that we can read this as well, for the devil's sin. Because the devil said, 
by choosing advantage over justice, I am choosing what justice ought to be. And it should be what benefits me. And that's placing himself in the moral position of God as sort of moral legislator. And saying that this, the thing that I'm choosing to do, I'm choosing to do it. And therefore, what I'm implicitly saying is, this is the right thing to do. And by saying it's the right thing to do, you're contradicting justice, but justice implemented by God. Justice that can only be implemented by God being the creator. And so you're placing yourself as the as the ultimate moral authority for yourself. It's a kind of self-worship. And that's how uh, Anselm, at least here, is reading Satan's choice for advantage over justice as a kind of pride and not merely a, um, it, might be, it might be easier to read this as a kind of greed, maybe, like wanting something for yourself that you should give to others, or envy, right? not wanting something for others that you can't have yourself. Or, um, uh, anything else, this could be wrath even, anger at God for not receiving something, something like that. And these are all relatively common readings of, of the fall of Satan. But we know it's pride, and that seems like a weird thing for it until we start looking at it in this way, in terms of when we choose something wrong, what we're ultimately choosing is to place ourselves in the place of God in this moral sense. All right. Make sense? Questions? What do you guys think? What if we choose something wrong that doesn't have an advantage to us? Like, I don't know, like putting ourselves just, you know, in a worse place. Okay, so I think that, let's go look, let's think about the pears as well, right? Augustine Gate got no advantage from stealing those pears. There was nothing about that that benefited him. He wasn't going to eat them. He didn't want them for any reason. I guess it was fun, but why? What was fun about it? It's not like picking fruit is fun, really. Especially if you're not planning on eating them, if you're just planning on throwing them away. Like, what are you doing? Similarly, when I, you know, threw rocks at fences when I was a when I was a teenage hooligan, right, I got no advantage from that. When the rock bounced off without breaking the fence, I didn't even get the satisfaction of having succeeded, right? I failed, I gained nothing from it, and yet I still shouldn't have done it. So the only benefit, the only advantage that could come from a choice like that is the the way Augustine reads this, and I think this is a good way of reading it, is it's an attempted usurpation of God's authority. It is, it's an attempt at sovereignty. You ever do something just because you can? Well, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. And sometimes that's morally neutral, right? Because sometimes the things that we can do are perfectly acceptable. They're things that we ought to be able to do. You know, once in a while, you'll just want to do something. And sometimes that will be within your, your, proper, your proper authority, something that you, you ought to do as the kind of person, the kind of thing that you are. But sometimes, when you just want to do something just because, sometimes that's something that you ought not to do for some reason. Right? Not for any good reason, but, it, I mean, even think about Something, uh, something maybe less, uh, less morally significant, but, but uh, something like intrusive thoughts, right? You ever think, huh, what if I just knocked over that cup? Why? If I decided to just knock this cup onto the ground, knock over my coffee and have it spill all over the ground, that would not only not benefit me, but it would harm me. I wouldn't have the rest of my coffee to drink, and that would be a bad thing. But I might desire it. And so I would be even willing, strictly speaking, not only against justice, well, not really, not really against justice. There's nothing wrong with dumping coffee out here, right? That's fine. 
I mean, we're outside. Um, but if I were to do that in the classroom, say, knock my knock my coffee off the ta off the desk onto the carpet and just leave it there, right? I would not only be, in that case, I'd be willing against justice because I would be damaging something. Somebody would have to clean it. I'd be imposing a duty on somebody else, all of that stuff, right? All the moral stuff. It would, be in, it would be unjust, but it would also be something that I could will that was against my own advantage. All that I would be willing was, well, as Augustine reads it, sovereignty. I'm asserting my ability to do things contrary to anything else, anything that would hold me back. And so that's how he winds up reading this, right? That's how he winds up reading um, Augustine, that is. That's how he winds up reading these, these weird moral cases where we do something wrong that doesn't even seem to benefit us. Now, those are rare cases. Most of the time when we do something wrong, it's because we think we're going to gain from it somehow. Um, maybe it's not straightforwardly, um, but at least in most cases, when we do something wrong, it's, it's to gain our own advantage. And so that's the simpler case, and that's and so that's where Anselm is going for for the fall of Satan. But I think it's important to notice here that 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 wouldn't have to be the case. And Anselm limits it down to looking at justice and advantage, having these two possibilities, these two options, that sometimes come into conflict with one another. But this is why I said there's at least two wills that we have: justice and advantage, because we also might have other wills. There might be other things that we want. Um, for example, you might have a will for someone's advantage, not just your own. And for someone you care about, doing what is beneficial to them at the expense of all else is not necessarily just. Right? So if I were to, uh, if I were to start robbing banks so that my kids would have money, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it. I'm not doing it for my own advantage. I'm doing it for someone else. But what I'm doing is still contrary to justice. Right. <clears throat> so we might have other wills other than these two, but two is enough. Right? Two is enough for the sake of the thought experiment to kind of figure out how these uh, how these kinds of choices work uh, in terms of you know angelic choices. Anything else? Questions? Additional comments or concerns about this? Move not. Okay. So, chapter five. There's part of this I want to skip, and it's why there's like a half a page footnote here, um, because I don't want to bother with that part because it's it gets wildly complicated and incredibly speculative, and it's something I don't I don't care about. Um, it's it's about the it's about the number of beings in heaven, which is important for some reason to Anselm. I, I've read the book that he's referring here, Codeus Homo, Why God Became Man. His argument for this conclusion in that book, I don't get it. I don't get it. I like that book. He makes a lot of good arguments. That one's not one of them. Anyway, maybe I'm being harsh, but I'm, I'm allowed to be harsh to the people we're reading. Anyway. Well, yes? Like how many angels can like, dance on ahead of a pen? Is that like I a mean, question? Sort of. I mean, that's not in particular. That was, but it's okay. Fine. Here we go. I gotta explain because I'm like, well, <laughs> why did I do this? Okay. Well, how many so, angels can so dance like, on the head of a pen? How many infinite, angels are available to dance on the head of a pen? An infinite number, as many as God wants to dance. That's how many. Oh. Um, they take up. Angels take up no space. That's the point. That's the point of the question. Of oh. that's why that question in particular so is the like thing. Like the souls as well? no, like he's okay. So he is asking. Okay, how do we know? All right, why is it that there are, in particular, as many human beings as there are, and why are there as many human beings as there are who are saved, and how many are, how many are fallen? Why is this? Oh, like and he wants to point this out, something like that, right? He wants to ask this because he thinks that when God created the world, there was a perfect number of, uh, of people in heaven, let's just say, the angels. And then... Some of the angels fell. And so, because this was all part of God's design, part of, the, part of that design was that those fallen angels would be one for one, numerically replaced by glorified human beings. So whenever an angel falls, a human being goes up to 
not whenever. We're talking about by the end, at the end of the worlds, okay. end oh, state, okay, okay, right? Okay, end state. Gotcha. Once everything is perfected okay. uh, at the second okay. coming and the, the the recreation of the world and all of that, there will be a perfect number of persons in heaven, which will be the same number as when the world was created and all of the angels were in heaven. Okay. So his, that is like his, a prime number. number? What number is <sighs> he doesn't say. Oh, okay. He doesn't yeah. say because so why would he know that, you. right? He, yeah. His point here, why he thinks this is the case, is because when God created the world and said this is very good, what he takes that to mean is perfection. And part of that perfection is the perfect number of unfallen persons. And so if that's the perfect number of unfallen persons, they have to be replaced once some of them fall. That's his reasoning. It's not great. It's, I get it. I get the argument, right, that if the world was created as perfect and then it fell, it needs to be re-perfected, right? And if it were more than that, then why that, that initial number would not have been perfect? Yada, yada, yada. Okay, we get it. So then That's does fair. that mean that there's only like a finite number of people who will like go to heaven? Well, technically, yes. That's what I mean, the Bible says. Yeah, but if you like, you know, believe in Jesus and yeah. like God and everything yeah. like that, then unless you're like a Calvinist or you believe in like determinism. Well, let's suppose that, let's suppose, maybe counterfactually, whatever, let's suppose that every human being who has ever lived and will ever live will be in heaven. That's a finite number. It's a really big number, but it's finite, right? It's in the trillions right now. That's not that big, right? There's, and so if the world ended tomorrow and every human being who has ever lived is going to be in heaven, then that means that there were, I don't know, a couple of trillion angels who fell and however many who didn't. That's a finite number. It's a really big one, but it's finite. Right? That's what he's saying. He's not saying that, it, that, that, that the number is specifically limited to, like... You just have to replace the angels of fall. That's 42. Yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not 42. <laughs> yeah, replace the angels of fall. Right, okay. it's, a, it's a weird argument, and it's, it's a huge distraction, and I'm, I, I regret spending time on this, but I mentioned it, so that was my fault. It's important. It's a part of it. You don't I, know where he went kind of off the rails. I don't even think it was. I don't think it was off the rails. I think it was. It was overly speculative. That's all. Off the rails. Why are you going too into it? it like, like don't worry Benjamin. about it. <laughs> like a Terry Pratchett novel. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. It's. Um, he's trying too hard with the world building of the world, the actual world. Um, anyway. Yeah. I. Uh, I digress. Yeah. I digress. Unfortunately, that was too much of a digression for that point. Um, then again, like I said, there's a half of pa there's a half a page of footnote to try and explain this. So, Sorry, you did a spark note. yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So the important part of chapter five <laughs> is that before the fall of Satan, all of the angels, not only those who fell, could have fallen. They could have chosen to sin. Okay. And that is because of how the choice was set up. Because the same choice was presented to all of the angels, those who wound up falling and those who wound up retaining justice. Okay, what was the choice? Is it like, who do you follow? If God or the devil type of thing? Do you, do you think that the, would the, work, the but Satan is right for his position of doing what he did? Or do you not think he's right for his position for doing what he did? So those who like agreed with him. That fall. would work, but that doesn't explain the fall of Satan himself. Right? And the issue here is that this choice is meant to have been made at the primal moment of creation. This was all simultaneous. Angels are, um, at, by this understanding, because they're not material, because they because they aren't um, aren't corporeal. Angels don't experience time the way that we do. They experience time, but but they are not a part of it. It's complicated. Don't make me. Don't make me start. I I. I Philosophy of time gives me a headache anyway, and especially when angels are involved, but I digress more. Um, but the point here, the, the important point is, the primal choice of the angels, both the good angels and the fallen angels, all of them occurred simultaneously at the moment of their creation. And so it couldn't really have been, well, Satan has decided to fall, so the rest of the angels are presented the choice, God or Satan. It was more like, well, what? What was the choice for the devil who fell? I really want to 
gonna say like, I mean, it might be wrong. Might That's be wrong. fine. But it's a good start. Yeah, is it is it like the that they had? I guess because they have knowledge. All like they have all yeah. the knowledge. They know. So is it like they had the knowledge that that was gonna happen as well, and it was just like inevitable. Like, they didn't tell God, I guess? Interestingly, no. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, where is this? Okay, no. Nope. speculate that some of them knew and didn't tell him. That's how he, like... Where is this? It's late in the dialogue, so I'm going to have to find it eventually. We'll get there in particular. Ah, here we go. In chapters 22, 23, and I think 24, yeah, 24 especially, um, so jumping way ahead, this is on page 95 if you're looking, um, Anselm points out that the devil and those who fell could not have known that their choice would lead to their falling. And the same applies to the good angels. They could not have known that their choice would have resulted in their not falling and the devil's choices would have resulted in their falling. So was it just that, that it was going to happen regardless and that God was the only one who decided? Like, he's the only one who knew what he was going to do and that's it? Like, it was just going to happen? Well, no and yes. Right? I say no first because it is importantly the choice of the angels. But I kind of say yes because, well, God is responsible for, for giving them the will and giving them the capacity for choice and giving them perseverance and all of that stuff. But again, like we were talking about last time, right? When, even though God gives perseverance of the will, justice, to the good angels, those who do not fall, he doesn't give perseverance of the will to the fallen angels because they don't receive it, because they reject it. But the rejection was them. But what was that rejection? What was the choice? I mean, we know it was something to do with something to do with a conflict between justice and advantage. How did this work? Mm -hmm. Well, doesn't it like still all boil down to like pride, like believing mm -hmm. that like you know, Satan believes that he is, if not equal to, then, like, greater than God, and he should have, like, the decision to make that choice or, like, be greater than him. And so, like, it's not necessarily the choice of, like, oh, well, I think Satan, like, is greater than God. I, like, maybe it's supporting the fact that he thinks that he is and he should be able to make that decision for himself, like, have that kind of autonomy that the other angels wouldn't recognize. It's something like that. And we're getting close to it. So, now, that is, I think what you said is ultimately the significance of the choice. That's what, that's what made the choice important. But what was he choosing between? What exactly? What do you mean by what was he choosing? I mean, like, the creation of, like, like the yeah. actual place? Or, or yeah, where okay. those who well, like, what did he do? What did he actually do? I mean, that was that was what he was choosing at a at a sort of a symbolic level. Like choosing himself over well, man, basically. Something like that. So this is one this is one speculative reason, right? And and I want to get into this because it's actually a, it illustrates the same point that Anselm was making in a different way. Right? Choosing, right? Uh, rejecting the notion that mankind is going to someday be greater than the angels. So, by the way, there's a reason that Anselm doesn't really address that as a possibility, and it's because it hadn't really come up in the tradition yet. Um, that was mostly um, not invented out of whole cloth, but, but greatly expanded upon by John Milton hundreds of years later uh, in Paradise Lost. But it illustrates, I think, the same point, that Satan wishes to see himself as the most important aspect of creation and wants for himself as close to perfection as he's ontologically capable of achieving and wants to be the pinnacle of creation. Okay. So how Anselm presents this choice, this is again hypothetical because we don't know exactly what God did here. Right? 
We asked us to suppose, and this is in this is in chapter six. I mean, this is basically the, the entirety of chapter six. He asks us to suppose that God presented the angels, the good and those who would fall, with a choice. He gave them everything except one extra thing. Almost everything that they could possibly have for their own advantage, he gave them at their creation. But he withheld something. And he said, commanded the angels to be satisfied with what they had, basically. But he left open the possibility of willing, in that second sense, the desire for this extra something that would be advantageous to them. Now he's really unclear about what this is till later. Later on he explains what this is, but, but I don't want to get there yet because we need a lot more explanation to figure out what the extra something is. But there's an extra something that is there, but God says to the angels, do not seek this extra something. And so we have a choice presented. As an angel, do you maintain what you have, be satisfied with what you have, and reject, will against, this extra something that you're not supposed to will? In other words, do you, re do you maintain rectitude of the will? Do you maintain justice by willing what God has commanded you to will and rejecting this extra something that would benefit you, but you're not supposed to have yet? I'm sorry, I, I let it slip yet. That's the trick. Not supposed to have. Not supposed to have. Do you will the extra something and therefore choose against God? Or do you remain satisfied with only what you have? Do you will for advantage at the expense of justice by reaching and seeking what you're not supposed to have? Or do you will for justice at the expense of advantage? Justice, maintaining what you have and rejecting this additional thing that would benefit you. That's the choice. OK. So what happens? Well, as far as their own will, con will is concerned, he says about the good angels, they lost that good for the sake of justice, that extra thing. They don't have it. It's, it is gone for them forever. They cannot achieve it because they have not willed to achieve it. They have lost not only the, um, they still have the will for advantage, but that advantage is now directed towards the things that they merely have, not this additional thing, because they have willed against it. They have willed to reject it. But he continues, but the good angels received it as a reward for justice and they remain forever in secure possession of what they had. So, as a reward for the good angels not seeking this additional something that they weren't supposed to have, they then receive the additional something. And they have everything they could possibly want for their own advantage. Okay? What this means is their will for justice, in other words, what they ought to will, and their will for advantage what will benefit them are for all and only the same things. Everything they could possibly will for the sake of their own advantage, they already have and they ought to have. So there's nothing they could will for the sake of advantage that they couldn't have, that they're not supposed to have, that would be unjust. Similarly, there is nothing that they could will for the sake of justice that they don't already have that benefits them. So there's no will for justice that is contrary to their own advantage. The wills for advantage and justice wind up now becoming for the exact same things. And so everything they can possibly will is both advantageous to them and just. And so they're always going to will justice. There's no longer a conflict between the two. OK? What about the devil? OK? Satan wills this additional something, wills to achieve this, this thing that he was not given. Cool. Satan being a finite creature, an, uh, an angel, can't get this of his own accord. Because what do we have that we have not received? Nothing. And it's not like we can add something to our own being of our own accord apart from God and God's will. So by striving to achieve this extra something, he fails to get it. But in trying to achieve it, what he is also doing is he is rejecting justice. The justice by which he has everything that he has. 
So all of the other advantageous things that he has, he has rejected in favor of this additional something that he did not have. So by rejecting everything that he did have, he loses everything advantageous to himself by rejecting it, fails to obtain the thing he was seeking, and so now has what? What does he have now? After rejecting everything that he had, failing to achieve what he was seeking. He doesn't have anything. I mean, right. he doesn't really have anything. Yeah. He loses everything that could be adjust. He loses everything that could give him advantage. All he has is his own being. And even that is not beneficial to him. It is for his perdition. It's punishment. It is for his his experience of loss of everything that he had. And so in this state, once, once the devil has rejected everything that he was given and failed to achieve what he was seeking, and he now has nothing, either advantageous or just, now he's in a similar state, but opposite to the, to the unfallen angels. Everything that he possibly could will can only be for advantage, for his own advantage. Even if he wills now to reject this additional something which he could not get, well, first of all, he can't will to reject it. He doesn't have it. Because that would be the just thing to do, but he already lost it, so he can't. He can't will to return to his original state of justice, because that would be a will to regain the advantages that he had. It would be a will to advantage contrary to the justice that he had abandoned. And so, anything that Satan could possibly will can only be for advantage and can only be against justice. So every choice the devil makes is in line with this initial choice, against justice and for his own advantage, but failing to achieve it. And so, by presenting this choice, and by Satan making this particular choice, making the evil choice, rejecting God's will, what God does is he presents a choice that makes Satan damn himself voluntarily for all of eternity. And the student says, nothing could be more just and more beautiful than this distinction. And I wholeheartedly agree, because that's why it's underlined with exclamation points. So regardless, you make sure you don't get away Yeah. And it's not that he didn't get away with it because God punishes him directly for it. He gets away with he doesn't get away with it because, because it is a natural consequence of his unjust choices. All right. What do you think? Makes sense. This is the um, I, I mentioned I had another video lecture on on the fall of the devil. This is the chapter that I'm mostly referring to in that one. Um, that's where I make the Star Wars comparison and all that stuff. So if, it's in the supplemental material, so if you want to check it out, it's there. Um, I, won't, I won't drag that in here because it's, there's a lot to say, but I say it there. So if you're interested, that's, that's where to find that. All right. Okay, so this is the point where the student na asks the natural question of, what was this extra something that God said to the good angels not to have and, and the, the, uh, that Satan sought? And uh, the teacher says, I don't know. Literally. I don't know what it was, but whatever it might have been, all we need to know is that it was something they were able to obtain, which they did not receive when they were created, in order that they might ad advance to it by their own merit. So in other words, it was something that they could have, they could have chosen. They they were capable of having the uh, the inclination for it, but not capable of actually achieving. Whatever it was, it just had to be advantageous to them. Now we'll look at. He gives an answer for this later on, but it's in like I think chapter twenty-five or six or something. So it's late. It's late because we need to we need to work through a lot to get there first. All right. Quest, any other questions on this part? Pretty good.
All right. Time does that mean? Who has the time? 45. 45. Okay, we got we got 15 minutes. Cool. All right. So uh, let's move on forward then. To well, I'm just going to go ahead and lump together seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Because this whole section is about the nature of evil and nothing. What's nothing mean? The value. The absence of something. Okay. So that's good and careful and precise. Why do you say the absence of something? Well, if there's like nothing, then there's like not anything there. So the absence of something, you know, if, if I kicked the tripod over, then there would be nothing there because I kicked it over. I removed something that had already been placed there. Yeah, so what he's looking at here is, well, first of all, evil. We defined evil as nothing, right? Evil is simply non-being or lack of something, all right? So what does evil refer to, and why do we say that the devil's choice was evil? If we say it was evil, that means it, it was something, but evil means that it's nothing. Right? Similar problem with just nothing, right? setting aside the moral dimension. If we say that there is nothing, well, does nothing mean something, or does it mean nothing? If it means nothing, then it seems to be meaningless. But if it means something, then it seems like it's not nothing. Okay. So eventually what he winds up settling on is something like what you were saying, right? It's the absence of something, but the emphasis has to be on the absence, right? The absence by comparison. So we have to be careful with that even as well, worth noting, because if we're, if we're saying the absence by comparison, we can say something like, well, perhaps uh, we can speculate if there were nothing in existence, nothing existed. It's not like nothing in that, excuse me, in that case would contrast with something else, because there is nothing else, simply nothing. But it's the absence of what could be there, something like that. Right? Something I mentioned in, in, I think this was in, in the other class, I think it was even last year, I think it was the one, the one I recorded, so if you, if you happen to go back and see that, um, I, I mentioned this briefly that um, there's way, 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 way too much written about the philosophy of holes. Like, what is a hole? A hole. Like, an actual hole. Or like here. I have a buttonhole in my jacket right here. What is this? A hole? Yeah. It's, 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 not even it's, it's the matter. absence of matter, fine. But look where it is. It's right here. Cool. The absence of matter is still there. The hole has moved. It's weird, right? It's, it's weird. It seems like the hole is delineated, and so it's defined by its delineation, by its limits, right? But, but nothing is even more complicated than that, still. Because right? it can't be defined by its limits, right? If you knocked over the tripod, it's def right? the nothing that is there is defined by the tripod being somewhere else. But if it pops out of existence, it's not defined by the tripod not being there, but being somewhere else. It's just not being there. Like right? someone took it and removed it and took it away to their house. Well, it would still be there, though, right? Uh -huh. So there'd be nothing here. I mean, there'd be air and stuff, but like, forget about that. There'd be nothing here. But it could, we could still maybe define that in terms of the tripod, which was here being elsewhere. Right? But we don't want to do that, right? We want to say that nothing simply means the absence of anything. Yeah, it's non-being, but that's a weird thing to try and define. Uh, and this is also why he, why he goes into detail about uh, the difference between nothing, not something, and um, what's the other one? Nothing, not something, and quasi something. Yeah, something that is, uh, it's not actually something, but it's, but it is, uh, it's, it's 
Oh, uh, God, I can't say this without saying something, so I apologize. It's something insofar as we can name it. Okay. You can refer to it. Is it more like an idea than an object? Even there, no, right? Because ideas have being in some sense. They refer to something. Maybe they refer to a configuration of things. Maybe they refer to, uh, to a concept. Maybe they refer to a thought. Maybe they refer to a state of things, right? Things that actually are. But quasi something, in the case of like nothing, what nothing refers to, is referring to the absence itself, which is a weird, again, a weird thing to refer to. So by saying nothing, what we mean is not something. So what we're referring to is the negation, right? It's the negation of there being something that we're referring to. Not simply the absence, not simply the, the vacuum, right, so to speak. We're referring to the negation of there being something. That's what he's going for. Right? OK, why is this important? Well, OK. Why this is important is because when we're talking about the will, when we're talking about choices, to say that there is an evil choice is to say that there is a choice which has nothing. But we need to distinguish that between, from a good choice. And that seems like, again, a weird distinction to make. It's a weird distinction to make because we are, we are saying that there is something about the there's something about the something which is not something. Right? We see where this is getting twisted and turned and weird, I think. So if we say that a choice is evil or a will is evil, what we can't be saying is that, you OK? I don't know. I thought I saw like a giant it was bird. shadow. Oh, it may have been a bird. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, you know what? I'm going to use an analogy here. Speaking of, a shadow. Why aren't there shadows at night? Because it's dark, it's dark. The light doesn't give you a reflection or something like that. It's a something to do with that. Okay. So a shadow is the absence of light, right? There's a shadow, say, underneath the chair, right? At night, if the lamp is off, is it lighter or darker? underneath this chair. OK, so there's a shadow, right? No. No, we wouldn't say that there's a shadow under the chair at night. It's, dark. it's darker. There's less light. There's more of an absence of light. It's weirdly analogous light. There even shadow the absence. Yeah. yeah, but what the hell does that mean? It's nothing. It's the absence of something. It's not something. So why is there a shadow when it is lighter than there's not when the, than when there's not a shadow, right? So again, like if I hold my hand out and there's a shadow on the ground, it's not like it's pitch dark. At night, it is darker than that right there on the ground, right? So a shadow is not simply the absence of light. It can't be. There's something else to it. You know? Well, like in the Vampire Diaries, you know, okay. the vampires have these like humanity switches. Okay. So they can like turn off their humanity, and so okay. instead of just being like actively evil, they have an absence of what made them human to begin with. Okay. They're like literally nothing, and that nothingness leads them to make like evil decisions. But it's mm -hmm. like really like it's more of a neutral state than. Yeah, they're completely okay. like I've never watched, I've never seen the Vampire Diaries, but okay, I see where you're going with this, and I think that I think you're on the right track. That it's not just the lack of humanity or the lack of emotion. My sunglasses have that, but that's very different. This is very different from, say, to use that example, a vampire, uh, you know, temporarily or otherwise lacking its humanity. If you were to say that someone is bald, how would you describe them? 
Hairless. Hair. Hairless. In what sense? Top of my head. Okay, cool. So you can be bald but have a beard, right? Yes. It's not on the top of your head, though. There we go. Okay. So baldness refers to a lack of something. But it's not just the lack of something. Are the palms of my hands bald? I mean, you wouldn't say that. Technically. Yes. I mean, yes, but, n but not really, right? Why would we say something like that? That's silly. Right? What we mean when we say that something is, that someone is bald, is they lack what, we would ordinar what they ordinarily would have, hair on their head. When we say that someone is clean shaven, right, we would say that they don't have a beard, the kind of thing that would be growing here. But we don't say that someone is bald because they don't have ha hair on their hands. Right? You wouldn't call a fish bald. They are, technically. But you would never say that because that's, that's weird. That's, that's, that's not a proper application of the term. So what he's saying here is that e the evil of a will is not merely the absence of good. It is the absence of the good that that will ought to have and ordinarily would have were it not for a particular lack of something. That's what he's, that's what he's getting at here. That's what he's saying. That way, real quick, sorry. Okay, yeah. Yes, this will probably be the last thing for today. So yes. I, I will repeat this as slowly as I need to. The evil of a will or of a choice is not merely the lack of something, but it is the lack of something that it ordinarily ought to have. It is something that is missing. Missing there is, I think, a great way of looking at it, right? You wouldn't say that someone is missing if they've never been somewhere before, right? Or if they're not born yet, yeah. right? So my, my sixth child is not missing. I just don't have a sixth child. Oh, that. <laughs> At least not yet. I don't know. I, I might someday. I might someday. I don't, I don't want to rule it out. But the point being, though, right, is that um, it's not merely like, evil in terms of the will. It's not merely the absence of justice. It's the absence of justice in something that ought to be just or that we ought to expect to be just. That's what he's pointing out here. Right? And that's why, that's why it's distinguished from nothing, simply speaking. Right? It's similar to a hole, right? A hole isn't just empty space. It's, it's empty space where there would otherwise be, say, in, in the case of a shirt or a jacket, fabric. Right? Well, they're supposed to be, but there isn't, so there's nothing. It's missing, yeah. It's missing, it's, it's deprived of what it ought to have. Hold that. Make sense? Questions? All right, I think that gets us through chapter, at least into chapter 11. There's probably a little more to say in chapter 11, but, but we can probably move on to 12 next time. So we're, we're, we're getting faster. We are progressing more quickly as we go through. Um, but that's about all we have time for. So we're going we're gonna to pick up next time um, at probably chapter 12, or if there's anything else to discuss in 11 or so, we'll, we'll go back to it. But uh, we will uh, we'll move on from there and uh, get through the rest of it next week.